Well, hello. This is going to be a hopefully fairly condensed video about how to hook up old TVs. Where's the oscillator on this thing? What is this do? I'll make my adjustments here and... Here's a fairly old TV from the 80s. The ratcheting channel knobs. UHF, VHF, analog, fake wood grain. And these. What the hell are these? So this is often called twin lead. Two connections, two leads connect to this. Sometimes it's called 300 ohm. That's referring to the impedance. You want to match impedances, and that's due to power transfer. You want to minimize the loss. You want to match impedances. So if I'm connecting, this is a piece of twin lead cable, for example, you'll see the wires are spaced a very specific distance apart. That affects the impedance. So this is 300 ohms. And this is connected to a pair of rabbit ears. This is what this twin lead connection was originally meant for. Back in the old days when we had analog television, you had a pair of antennas, dipole antennas, or rabbit ears as they are often called, or you had a big antenna on your roof, and this is the kind of cable that you'd use to connect that antenna to your TV. You just had these little spade terminals that you screwed into the back of your TV. There we go. I've connected my VHF dipole antenna using twin lead, to these screw terminals that have an impedance of 300 ohm to the VHF connection because these antennas are meant for VHF or very high frequency uh, band signals. VHF refers to a band or actually two bands of TV channels that were used. Uh, channels 2 to 6 and 7 to 13 usually combined in, in one knob on the front here. UHF, ultra high frequency, was an even higher band introduced, I want to say in the 60s, and it used these loop antennas that you would just sort of screw these little hooks onto the back there. Now that I've introduced these, I'm going to tell you that none of this works anymore. You're not going to be using any of this. So what are you going to be connecting to your TV? Could be an old video game console, could be a VCR, something more era appropriate to this vintage. But whatever you're connecting, I bet you it's going to have coax. This is an F connector, but people usually call it just coax. Coax is the type of cable that you'll plug into here. Here's an example of coax cable. Here's another example of coax cable. This has a slip-on connector. So the thing about these coax connectors is it's a different impedance, 75 ohm. A lot of TVs that use these different types of connectors on the back will refer to this as 300 ohm and this is 75 ohm. That's the impedance. This little adapter here, sometimes called a ballon, usually called a matching transformer, is exactly what it says. It's a matching transformer. It has a little transformer inside that matches the impedance from 75 ohm to 300 ohm. So if you have an older television that you want to connect something to, and the VHF terminals are these old 300 ohm, you're going to need one of these, a matching transformer. Could look like this be an older one, look like this. Here it is connected. There you go. Simple, simple. Now, why did I say I need to connect it to VHF? In North America, there's two TV bands, as I mentioned earlier, VHF and UHF. VHF is the lower channels, very high frequency, but a lower frequency band than ultra high frequency or UHF. When devices started coming out that you could connect to a TV, things like a VCR, a game console, there were still TVs that didn't have UHF and only had VHF. Here's an original GE Portacolor from 1966. Back when in Canada, the UHF dial was optional. This is VHF only. And yet here it is with a console 30 years newer connected directly to it. No problem. So in order to make a device compatible with all the TVs out there, because remember the analog NTSC standard that we used up until 2009 in the US and I think 2011 in Canada dates back to the original TV broadcasts. NTSC color is backwards compatible with NTSC black and white. So you could have an ancient TV from the 50s or 40s and you could hook up the video game console or a VCR to VHF and tune it. And typically they would use channel 3 or channel 4. The idea being that no market would have a broadcast channel on 3 and 4 because they typically would leave a blank channel in between to avoid any noise or interference. 
So in your market, you would set your VCR, your game console to channel three or four, whichever didn't have an existing channel. So you wouldn't get any ghosting or noise from that channel interfering with your console or VCR. This is PBS. And it would be compatible with every TV ever made. I know in a lot of European countries they use UHF, but this video is for North America, so always connect to VHF. All right, let's start by hooking up a VCR. This VCR is from the 80s. I already did a video of connecting VCRs to TVs right up there. That gets into more detail on these. I'm going to be focusing more on the TV side for this. So up until the end of analog broadcast, all VCRs had a built-in RF modulator. And the way this would work is on VHF, again, remember VHF, it would take in an antenna, pass it to the tuner inside here so the VCR could record off TV, and if the VCR was off, it would pass that antenna signal directly out to your TV so you could tune with your TV. But if the VCR was on and playing, there's that TV VCR button, sometimes tape TV, that would turn on this RF modulator. And what that would do is that would cut the connection between these two. So your antenna is no longer going directly to your TV. And it would turn on a built-in RF modulator that would output the signal from the VCR onto channel three or four switched either on the back or on very newer models they did it in the menu and there it is some coax cable i use the slip-on cable from the out to tv into the back of this tv don't connect uhf i know you could connect the out to tv using some twin lead cable and connect it to uhf but that won't work what this is for is again back in the day you were recording off of TV some channels were on UHF so you would take the UHF antenna that normally went to your TV and pass it through here so both your VCR could record off of UHF and your TV could watch it but the video signal when you're playing tapes would never output on UHF on North American VCRs all right I have it connected and playing a tape great Connected to channel four, TV's on channel four, but I don't have picture. I want to talk about fine tuning. Older televisions had your coarse tuning where you can change between channels, but they also had fine tuning. Fine tuning is usually located as a little inner ring adjustment on these knobs. Sometimes you can just turn it, but sometimes it'll spin freely and you have to push in to turn it. Now some things to look out for with fine tuning. If you lose sync in the picture, kind of almost looks scrambled, that's a very common tell that your fine tuning is out. And just tuning it towards the signal, you'll get a picture. If you don't have color or the color looks very faded and kind of bleeding a little bit, that's also a sign. If you don't have color and you don't have audio, that's another sign. So, you know, in general, play with the fine tuning to try and find that perfect picture where it's nice and crisp, but you don't have a lot of those little squiggly audio lines in there. One other note, there's something called automatic fine tuning. What that does is if you're close enough to a perfect signal, it will lock in. But the problem is if the tuning is too far out, it won't work. What you're gonna to wanna to do when you're tuning in a channel, turn automatic fine tuning off. Tune the channel in the best you can, then turn automatic fine tuning on. So let's look at the back of this TV. It's around the same time period. It's actually a little older, but it's a more advanced TV. You have the same UHF and VHF twin lead connections, but there's also a 75, 75 ohm VHF in. Now look at how complex this is. What is this, like this little, thing that comes out and then the wire pushes in like that. You see it says 75 here, 300 there. So this is 300. So if I'm plugging in with a piece with a coax cable directly into here, I leave this wire disconnected. If I'm plugging in to the 300 ohm, then I need to take this little arm and plug it in. All this is is one of these. 
a matching transformer. More specifically, it's the opposite. This is a matching transformer that goes the opposite way. If I wanted to plug twin lead directly into this connection, I push this on and connect my twin lead here. This is just built into the TV. And this little wire is just this middle pin. That's all it is. Some TVs got fancier and had a switch that you could switch between them. But some, like this RCA, just had this little wire. Sometimes you'll also see a switch that says cable and normal. Back in the day, broadcast TV frequencies above channel 13 were different than cable TV channel frequencies above channel 13. It's a long-winded story. Uh, when cable TV first came out, they used lower channel frequencies that were still in the VHF band to go above channel 13. They lettered them channel A, B, C, D. Eventually, when cable TV started to become more common and TVs and VCRs started supporting those channels, they ended up numbering them. So you can have a channel 15 cable and a channel 15 UHF, and they are completely different frequencies, although there is an overlap. But the long and short of it is, for you, the average user, you don't care because this doesn't affect VHF. Channels 2 to 13, this only affects UHF. So unless you're doing something fancy like modulating on UHF or anything like that, it, this doesn't matter. So to connect that VCR to this TV, I don't need a matching transformer. I can just connect the coax cable directly. Just push this on like that. Now I'm connected on channel four. This has a digital synthesized tuner. So this kind of tuner, you have channel up and down, but it will automatically lock in. No fine tuning needed, none of that playing around. These are old vintage TVs, but these tuners are easier to use, assuming they're working. Fun fact about these little F connector, coax connectors, they're still on modern TVs. These are still used for the modern digital high def over the air broadcasts, because why not? It, it, RF is RF. So these have quite a bit of longevity. You can still buy patch cables for them. You can still hook an old device up to your modern TV on channel three or four. Now, I just want to talk briefly about these Nintendo RF adapters and those old game console TV switches. Here's a dirty secret. You don't need these. What this did back in the day is it did what you, the VCR did that I was just talking about. You had your antenna input going to your TV and to satisfy the parents, this would go in between the antenna that would normally plug directly into the TV. And when it got a signal from the game console, it switched. But here's the thing. This didn't convert video signal from the game console to RF. This little cable that plugged in here, this little RCA connection that was used on NES, Super NES, N64, and a plethora of other consoles of the era, this is RF just with a different connector. So if you want the best quality, skip those old game console switches, go on to Amazon or eBay or whatever supply store you go to, buy yourself one of these, or the opposite gender as actually probably better, female RCA to male F connector. And all you need to do, so I'm doing this on the back of this N64. This is the same RCA jack you'd see on a Nintendo, Super Nintendo plug my coax patch cable into it turn on and we will have game all right so i've covered two types of rf connections to the tv you're probably going to be using channel three or channel four you can use these old clunky knob tuners you can use a digital tuner like i showed there's also push button tuners like I'm showing on the screen right now. Those have presets that you would manually tune. So these push button style tuners are often called varactor diode tuners. And that's because they use an electronic component called a varactor diode. What a varactor diode does is it changes capacitance based on voltage applied to it. This means that instead of having a bunch of capacitors in your tuner, like on these old mechanical knobs, you can just electronically apply a voltage to pick a channel. These were sort of like an interim technology 
that allowed manufacturers to electronically choose a channel. So for example, if you want to use a remote control without having a big clunky motor or solenoid, or on a VCR, if you want to record several different programs, the VCR can electronically change channels. I did a video on a VCR that had a Varactor diode tuner. I'll link it here. I go into detail about how to set those up, but those uh, push button tuners are the same on a TV as they are a VCR. There's also a Varactor diode tuner that has what looks like a traditional tuning knob, but it's only a single one and it uses presets in the same way as the push buttons. These were pretty common on American made TVs, I guess, because Americans like to turn a knob instead of push a button. But overall, these weren't as common as the traditional mechanical knobs or the fully digital synthesized tuner. If I want to connect something that's not RF to an RF TV, if I want to connect a DVD player, video out of something, I need an RF modulator. What does that do? That modulates an RF signal, silly. Here is a DVD playing on my little RF TV connected to, yes, this is an RF modulator coming from a HD DVD, DVD player. All right, this RF modulator is just an example of one of many you could use. I'm showing some pictures on the screen right now of the more typical looking ones. I like this one because first of all, the aesthetic is beautiful. It also has all these useless dials that are supposed to get rid of noise and clean up the picture and you can do fade in and fade out and all the totally useless features. But it has two video sources that you can switch between. And it's a pretty decent RF modulator. If you even want to use an old broken VCR as an RF modulator, you can do that because they have composite video inputs and that RF output I talked about. Composite video. Usually it's yellow. Not always. Older televisions and devices sometimes didn't color code. This color code came along later. It is video only, but it is usually paired with audio, which is also color coded. White for left, red for right. But uh, let's talk a little bit about this composite signal. So looking at the back of this HD DVD player, there's a plethora of connections. There's the video connection, sometimes called composite, sometimes called uh, CVBS. This is a very common way to connect analog video devices. What this basically is, is this is the video signal that's being modulated over the air, but just the video signal. I don't want to get into too much detail, but in a similar way to how audio like this can be transmitted on FM radio, video plus audio can be transmitted over the air in the same way that FM radio was transmitted. Technically, the video is AM, it's amplitude modulated, and the audio is FM. But it's the same basic idea. You're taking the information on here, which is a 6 megahertz wide bandwidth of information, that's how big the video signal is, and you're modulating that video signal on a certain band of frequency called a channel over the air. And you're also packaging the audio beside the video signal within that band. Interesting tidbit about TV and radio. Because the audio of TV is FM modulated, mono TV sound is the same as mono FM radio sound. And channel 6 is right at the bottom end of the FM radio band. So back when there was analog TV, or even now in some US markets, channel 6 analog TV the sound of it can be tuned in on an FM radio. In addition to the composite signal, which is the most common signal, but also considered the worst quality because it contains all the video signal as a composite within this one connector, there's also S-Video, which is short for Super Video, which came out in the consumer market right around when SVHS, Super VHS, came out and use this connector for the essentially better video quality. What this does is this has a separate Luma and Chroma component. Luma being the black and white video signal and Chroma being the NTSC color signal that gets put over top of the Luma. So by separating these two, they don't interfere with each other and produce what's known as dot crawl. That's where the color signal interferes with the uh, Luma signal. 
So this is a better video transmission, though it's not very common. Other than SVHS VCRs, not a lot uses it, like DVD players did. Uh, the TV out on a lot of older laptops and computers offered S-Video. Some set-top boxes for digital TV did, but it's all but dead. Very uncommon. And to take it a step further, you have component video. Component is the three components that make up an NTSC video signal, thus called component. Composite is a composite signal of the three components. You have Y, which is your Luma, which is what I talked about here, and you have your two chroma components. Because interestingly enough, NTSC video takes your RGB video and converts it to a backwards compatible black and white signal and two color components. Uh, Technology Connections did a great video about how these two are calculated and with the three of these you can basically con convert them to the RGB signals that are used in a television for the three red, green, and blue guns. But despite this being red, green, and blue, this is not RGB. This is the three components of an NTSC video signal. Okay, so let's take it a step further. Um, I've converted composite video. Now let's convert HDMI. Let's get HDMI to this TV. So what I'm doing is I've now connected my HD DVD player using HDMI, which carries video and audio into this converter box that inputs HDMI and outputs either S-Video or Composite Video. I'm using the Composite Video to go into the RF modulator, out of the RF modulator using coax, into the matching transformer that goes from the 75 ohm coax to the 300 ohm twin lead, onto channel 4 of my television. Now, here's a problem. You'll probably be able to see what I'm talking about. See these bars on either side? Almost every HDMI to composite converter, HDMI to composite or composite to HDMI that I've used, just stretches the signal. So if you are outputting a 16 by 9 aspect ratio signal using HDMI into one of these, it's going to squish it. So this is a 4x3 movie, but because it thinks that this HDMI is going to a widescreen TV, it's outputting with the black bars on widescreen, and this is squishing it to 4x3. So a couple solutions. You, If this is coming from a computer, you can pre-squish the signal. Some computers, you can also output a 4x3 signal, a 480p signal on this to go into here and some of these converters will then treat that properly. In the case of my HD DVD player, I can actually set the TV shape. So let me just change it to four by three and let's see if that solves the problem. Will you look at that? No black bars, a perfect four by three signal. A beautiful sky blue. These connection methods should get you to be able to use any old vintage antique television out there. They all use the same RF connections. Uh, going back to at least the 50s, the 40s, as far back as possible. Now you're going to get humming in the audio with high contrast scenes. You're going to get flagging of the picture from a VHS tape on older televisions that didn't have a very stable horizontal. It, there are going to be other nuances, but generally connecting these, these are the standards you want to be concerned with. Another option is over-the-air digital broadcast TV. There are still over-the-air channels in North America. They're just digital now. So you, instead of using, you know, the tuner built in here, you would use an over-the-air digital tuner box. These are everywhere, so if you want to get one, I suggest you go to a thrift store and pick one up now. During the digital transition, especially in the States, these were all over the place. I'm pretty sure the government was just giving them away. Uh, you can still buy them, but they're not as common now because every TV that was sold for almost the last two decades has been mandated to have a built-in ATSC tuner. 
ATSC being the digital transmission standard in North America. As you can see, I'm tuning in a digital over the air channel. Got my single channel tuned in there. And you'll notice the snow. These are noisy electronic devices. They're, they're computers inside. This is a small computer. TVs of this era weren't designed to reject this kind of high frequency noise. It didn't exist. That's why AM radio is so horrible in 2022. It wasn't like that back then. We didn't have switch mode power supplies and computers all over the place. In the case of this device, the noise could be coming from this or it could be coming from that little power adapter. That guy right there. Those are little switch mode uh, power supplies and some of them give off a lot of noise. So, I mean, you can always just try a different power adapter on these or move them far away. At any rate, there you go. Now, I have my attic antenna connected. What you can do is buy one of those fancy digital antennas that they sell. But there's no such thing as a digital antenna. It's an antenna meant for the digital TV channels that are being broadcast. And what's different between those and the old analog channels? Nothing. Except most digital channels are on UHF. Whereas back in the analog days, most channels were on VHF. So most of the old antennas from the analog days favored VHF. Whereas nowadays, most of them are on UHF, so they're going to be tuned for UHF frequencies. Imagine something like this UHF loop antenna, only bigger. So, I mean, you can go and connect, say, rabbit ears like these to one of these matching transformers and plug it into the back of these boxes. But depending on the channel you're trying to tune in, you might not give you the best results. All right. When I said there's only two types of RF connections for TVs, that wasn't entirely truthful. Some portable TVs used an eighth inch or three and a half millimeter jack, usually used as an aux in, an audio jack or headphone jack for an external antenna. Now, if you read this one up close, it says 75 ohm external antenna. What that means is this is using a mono connection to connect a 75 ohm coaxial signal. Now you can go on Amazon, eBay and buy adapters like I'm showing on the screen, but I'm going to get a little creative. Three different adapters. This converts two RCA jacks left and right to a stereo headphone jack. What I can do is I can take the uh, mono connection, which is usually the left or the white connection, and I'm connecting a RCA to BNC connection. Ah, BNC. This is used on some commercial video stuff for your, comp uh, your composite signal. I wouldn't worry about it right now, but if you have like um, time-lapse VCR or commercial grade VCR you want to use or a PVM monitor and you want to connect a video signal, you're probably going to want a lot of these connectors. With that plugged in, I have another adapter. This has the screw-on F connector, coaxial 75 ohm, to go to the opposite gender BNC. And with all that plugged in, we have something that looks ridiculous. But it works. Well, that about wraps up this video. The whole purpose was to make sort of a short video to show people how to hook up these old TVs and still enjoy them. Didn't turn out to be short, but it's a video. I've also linked a bunch of uh, good videos to learn about other things with these vintage TVs. Um, things about the picture, how the picture is displayed, how it's made, how color TV works, how aspect ratio and resolution work, how these don't have pixels. So if you're interested in learning more, there's tons of stuff to watch down there. Thanks for watching.